Good morning. Yes. Good morning. So for everybody out there who's listening, I wanted to introduce our special guest for the morning, Martina Bergwerf. I'm not sure how you would say that for an English audience, but we're just going to say Martina Bergwerf, who is humanitarian team lead at Save the Children in the Netherlands. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Save the Children Netherlands is also a kind of international team lead on the humanitarian front within the international organization. So we are so grateful to you to take time out of this absolute crazy world and all you have to do um, to speak with us today to help call attention to the situation of refugees for Refugee Week and for World Refugee Day. Um, and I'm hoping, we're, we're gonna have more of a discussion than a formal interview, but I'm really hoping that we can talk about not just the plight and the concerns of, about the refugees, but also a focus on what can be done, what is being done, so that we also have a sense of help and hope, um, which was really the angle I wanted to take in my book. Um, you know, there, there was an old saying by Fred Rogers that when the world is in crisis, look for the helpers. Um, and Save the Children is really one of the biggest helpers. So we're, we're super grateful um, to have this chat today. I just wanted to mention I am sitting here in my son's room. So if anyone noticed that there are basketball posters, cats roaming around, don't mind. Um, we will just continue on. And just as one last point of introduction, uh, we know each other through Save the Children, where I serve on the Board of Trustees, uh, which is an absolute privilege to do. So maybe we can just kick off by your talking a little bit about the work that you do. What does the humanitarian team lead do? And particularly with a focus on refugee children, what Save the Children is doing, not just in, in Ukraine, but as we know, this is a worldwide problem. Um, just talk about a little bit more generally some of the things that you're doing to, to help, and then we can get into their situation. Yeah, sure. Good morning, Hollis. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, super happy to be here and to contribute um, to your day at Instagram. Um, so indeed, uh, I'm the team lead at uh, Save the Children Netherlands. Um, that means that I am leading the humanitarian team, but most of all, I'm also coordinating all the humanitarian efforts that we do at Save the Children uh, in the Netherlands, but especially, of course, around the world. Um, we as a team and as Save the Children are uh, working in many places. Indeed, it's much more than Ukraine. Um, we are uh, responding to uh, many different crises in the world, and then it's man-made crises and conflicts, but also um, natural um, uh, crises, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, floods. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, get and then climate refugees too, don't we? No, absolutely. I mean, yeah. that is one of the big multipliers actually at the moment. Um, so there's so much going on. I, I could talk hours about all the things that we're doing and all the countries that we are working. It is really at the moment, I couldn't find a continent that we're not working. It is really a global uh, crisis, I would say, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I think why Save the Children is one, one of the biggest responders is because all the crises in the world, whether they are man-made or natural, they are children's crisis because um, we have a lot of children in the world. Uh, more than half uh, of the refugees at the moment are children. Um, and I think we have a role, a very big role to play both at the humanitarian side and also on the structural longer term uh, side of things to, yeah. to support children in the places where they live, but unfortunately for many children also on the route they have to take to flee from whatever is hampering them from a normal life. So conflicts, as I said, uh, but indeed drought is another very important one that I, I'm sure we'll discuss today. Yeah. Um, and what we try to do is, I mean, I think our, our big asset is that we are already present in many places. We work in more than 120 countries. Um, and uh, we have the luck, so to say, to already be there for them. 
uh, and we before were before the crisis. Exactly. So in terms exploded. of a conflict, we were probably already providing aid, uh, and maybe more of a structural nature, or yeah. uh, preventing other uh, important things like uh, child diseases, but for example, child marriage as well. So yeah. normally, we are already present in many of the countries. Uh, so we were already there to help them and we know the communities, we know the people, we know the children. And then when a trigger happens or conflict or an extreme drought or anything that makes them uh, that makes it necessary for them to flee, uh, we are there at that place, but also on the route. Uh, and then you have to think about very primary basic support. Uh, medical support, um, clothes, uh, food, water, um, but it's much more than the very basic uh, things yeah. like that. Uh, education, of course, very, very, very important. And refugee uh, children are, of course, often without education, they're unable to yeah. attend school even before they become refugees through conflicts. Yeah. It's exactly. very disruptive. But let's actually come back to that point you just made, because um, I know Save the Children does wonderful work in the psychosocial support the children yep. need and creating child-friendly spaces. Yep. I think that a lot of people out there think, oh, thank goodness, they're safe. You know, they're over the border, they're yep. out of the conflict, but they're not fully safe no. they're they're not out of the trauma maybe you can talk about um absolutely that part of the equation yeah no because that was actually indeed uh, yeah. i think what i wanted to mention is we are happy when children find a safe place physically right so That's the base. their body their body is there um yeah. they enter into a safe country or uh, maybe even a safe place in a country but then that's not the end of it and i think that's even still the beginning of recovering, uh, yeah. having food in your stomach, having water, uh, being being men being physically well is okay, but the, the mental side of things, uh, they are so important. And I think yeah. um, we can imagine how it is, luckily I can't imagine, but we can think about how tragically it is for children to, to experience the, the things they have to see and, endure during during um uh during their their flight away from 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 home yeah uh, and what we try to do with child-friendly spaces uh, maybe it's good to explain a bit it, it's a very low threshold place it can be a tent it can be a yeah. room it can be a school uh, a place in the school it can be everywhere it can even be outside under a tree it, right. it, it, it's just really a place where so that they're um, easy to set up yeah, they're very easy to set up and we do it along the route. So, yeah. uh, for example, in the Balkans, uh, when they come from from uh, the Syrian route and Turkey, but also around in the, in the countries around Ukraine, even in Ukraine, I can I can tell you many places. I think all the places where we work, we work with child family spaces because they're so effective. And the reason for that is that they are very easy um tool for us to make the children child again and yeah. of course they are still children but um when they we see when they enter the the space i will call it a space whether it's a tree or a, a tent or whatever um there are books there are toys there are qualified and experienced colleagues who know how to who talk to children who know how to work with children who are um uh who have had training on uh, psychosocial support and, and these are local people who speak their language yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah that is key for us i mean they really need to feel at home very quickly and it has yeah. to bring them back to um to a safe place i mean they have been in very unsafe places along the route when they fl when they flee their countries or their homes uh, and we really want them to forget about that. So to laugh. Well, they probably light up even just for Absolutely, a moment yeah. when they, they see those remnants of childhood. I know also um, I've seen in so many places how therapeutic drawing pictures yeah. can be for them and and play, you know, certain kinds of toys or uh, cuddles, cut like knuffles and yeah. cuddle toys. You mentioned books too, and that's of course one of the main reasons. Talk to us a little bit about the role that 
books can play first, and we'll talk about for the non-refugees later, because I think that's also super important, but the for role that, that books can play for these children coming out of such a traumatic situation or still in a traumatic situation. Yeah. How often they how, are how still do they in... play a role? Yeah, that's a good question. I think often they are still in a traumatic situation because it's not only them, but also their, their parents and their family. Yes. So, you know, yeah. before they're actually being at a safe place for a longer term with, with safety, it's years, you know, before yeah. they are there. But I think what is very important for mental well-being of children, actually for all of us, but for children in particular, um, imagination is yes. super important. And I think books play a crucial role because stories and books and pictures and, and drawings in books, they give children the chance and the opportunity to step away from the horrors they are in and the, the, the memories they have and the images they have of being in the water, on a boat or somewhere where there's no food or people fighting or people being shot or killed. Yeah. But really yeah. going back to a book and just read about or counting as in your book, but or reading about um, uh, uh, an imaginary uh, child or an animal that is going on a trip or that is just experiencing a lot of things. It, it gives them li literally headspace yeah. to to think from uh, about other things than the, um, their daily life at that moment. So the, the hard reality. And I think imagination actually gives them the opportunity to be open again Mm -hmm. uh, in their minds and in their in their body for other for for nice things for for better thoughts um, and they bring it along to their families if, if they come back with a smile because they had such a nice idea or they read such a nice book it will actually bring a smile on the the, the mother's face as, as well right so I think you know, books it's interesting. Are... I'm going to interrupt you for a second because I know sure. you've recently become a mother and there's a saying that a mother is only as happy as her least happy child. Yeah. No, I can I can only <laughs> So when your child even in such a traumatic situation shows some light, some hope, um then that must be such an, an enormous difference. Yeah. Absolutely. Do they also feel, you know, there it, it's interesting because when I was first developing ideas for my book and I was um, chatting a lot with a friend of mine who's a Syrian refugee uh, here and kind of a reality check. And one of the things um, that she noticed particularly was the very few books about or for refugee children at the time, they were very dark um, and very scary. And you don't want to sugarcoat something, but she kept sort of shaking her head and saying, we know the horrors. Don't don't drag us through the horrors again. Yeah. Um, and that was then my goal of, of not painting a prettier picture than it is, but looking at it through the lens of, of hope and, and through help um, and imagination. Because, you know, and I, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about that, because there is, it is a horrifying adventure, but it is an adventure. And can we find, you know, when I was little and we had to go through something really, really difficult, Fortunately, never as difficult as this, although my family is a long line of refugees and difficult migrations, but my mother would always position it as an adventure. Um, and that helped. It was yeah. something that we, you know, and, and I think adventure, as you say, sorry, the cats are chasing each other. The adventure gives you imagination. Yeah. And vice yeah. versa. Yeah, no, so I think also you're right, we shouldn't sugarcoat anything, um, but we do want to prevent children to go through the horrors again. So it's yes. a really, yes. it's I would say it's a balance between being realistic and honest. I mean, children are, they're far from, you know, stupid or naive. They know exactly what is going on, yeah. right? Also, when, when you go on holidays and you try to keep everything as normal as possible just before you go, they always, it's, you know, they, they know. always know something is happening. So um, I think it's very important to to also just name things as they are. Um, but there are different ways of doing that. It doesn't have to be dark. It has to be, you can also make it gentle and respectful 
but yeah. at least because I think it's also Those if you show wonderful coat, words, gentle and respectful. Yeah, I love yeah, that. And, and I think if you if you keep things. Uh, if you sugarcoat things, then they will have they, they'll have the feeling that their feelings that they of course have they can't be they're not allowed they they shouldn't be right. there. But you should uh, confirm that it's okay to have those feelings and those thoughts and those those traumatic images in their minds. But it's it's yeah. how we deal with them, right? And how we. Right. Um, then talk about those those things with them. I think that is crucial. That's that's such an important point. Um, they they need to feel seen and validated, yeah. and that's that's respected. I think that's that's your your point yeah. as well. I'm getting a warning that we only have five minutes, um, so I want to um, talk to you about this for hours. But be, be, certainly before we we close, and just in case, and hey, these cats. Guys, they are seldom like this. I think they're doing this for an audience. Yeah. Um, do you hear that? Yeah, no, but yeah. I, I think hey. it's, oh yeah, now I see them. Hey, I might just grab one. What I, I you think, I'm going to ask you the question, I'm going to grab a cat. I would love for us to talk about some of the harsh realities in terms of numbers. We were talking earlier just a short time ago, the number of displaced people, which includes displaced people in their own countries, yeah. was 30 million, then it was 60 million, 80 million, it's now 100 million, and the refugees, yeah. I think, are now 30 million. Yeah. Um, my book came out in 2020, and it was two-thirds of that. Yeah. So just in the past few months, uh, it has absolutely exploded. And is it still the case that at least half of those refugees of those 30 million are children and a lot of them are yeah. unaccompanied from what I understand. Exactly. Yeah. So you have the figures right. Um, and indeed, there are so many children uh, among them. I, I think it's still, I, I don't I mean the percentages change weekly at the moment, but exactly, it's still yeah. roughly half of them are children. And I think uh, we're both mothers. A lot of them, a lot of the parents also try to give their children a better future. So a lot of them are being sent on a, on a trip or on a route to yeah. Europe or to wherever, to Turkey, or could be anywhere um, for a better future. So a lot of them are unaccompanied and there are the Often risks. With smugglers. Yeah, it's horrible. If you, if you look at the, um, the risks that a children, that children are facing along the route, uh, you know, again, it can be lack of food, lack of water, uh, medical things, but really the sexual abuse, the exploitation, uh, it's, really a big, it's really a big concern of me that a lot of people, they just went to the border with Ukraine to fetch people to, to save them, but we just don't have any clear view on sometimes where they are, where those children right. are. And I mean, you, you've seen the images of, of Afghani women who gave their children over the fence to to uh, soldiers, uh, U.S. soldiers, to give them a better future. And now they can't find their child anymore. Right. I mean, I really hope that there, I, I, I hope and I, I, that's my my confidence in this world sometimes. Maybe I'm naive that most of those children, you know, uh, will have found uh, a good place. But, but not all uh, of them. Not no, all. and I think every child is one too too much. To, or yeah, there's, yeah. Um, every child should have a good a good place to to have the same chances as every child. Yeah, I think uh, this is such an important point. Um, you you'd like to think that we're in 2022 and that we would be in a better place, but instead we're feels like we're sliding backward. You know, yeah. a lot of the progress that was made for children in general um, in, in terms of poverty, but also refugees. Um, and there, there's not really an end in sight, but no. um, maybe, you know, as we just close in our last minute, if there's, if there's one sort of big message that you'd like to leave, one big thought that you'd like to leave with everybody about child refugees, um, a source of hope, something to yeah. to have us think about. 
No, of course, and uh, it's it's quite a for a minute. It's quite an assignment. Uh, it's no, unfair. I, yeah. No, I mean, I think at the moment to to briefly summarize the the issues are for children are all around climate, COVID, conflict, and I mean, I I I hope. I, we can solve that, but we really need the international community. So we do our part and we do our best every day. My colleagues, I'm so proud sure of them. Do. In the in the the countries where we work, they are effortlessly doing what they can, and we will go through with that as long as it's necessary unconditionally. Um, but I always say, no matter what, that saved the children for me. Yes, no, it's true, oh, and, and I really feel feel like that uh, every day. Um, but we need the international community. We need uh, the governments uh, as well. So I, we can only do it together. Um, but I am confident that if we are able as an international community to uh, put our money where our mouth is and to really uh, change just a few things already around climate, our own behavior as well, uh, we can have an impact uh, for children wherever they are. I mean, the fact maybe for, for those who are watching, um, I think in East Africa, they, the CO2 emission is only 1% of the, the global uh, when you look at the climate, but the effects But they're there, the big victims. Yeah, yeah. so I, I know it's easy for us to, to do everything as we did in the past because we don't really see the effects, maybe except the, the warm weather. But be aware of you know, what we do here directly has an effect on yeah. children. So if I would put a message of hope, it is us. Yeah. It is us who can make a difference. Be, it's be the change, right? Yeah, no, story. absolutely. And um, I really feel strong about that. And um, I hope that people can take that along today and this week and this summer and their lives, actually, uh, that they can actually really, they can make a change for children. And I really hope we can do it together. Well, thank you so much. That's such a great message. And I told you, I'm going to send you well, the Dutch version of my book as a thank big, you. it's a little thank you. It's a little gesture. Um, Much appreciated. But we are so, so grateful, um, not only for your time today, but for all of the important, urgent work that you do. And we wish you every success in helping build a better, safer world for all thank of our you. kids. Well, and thank you for playing your part as well, Hollis, in this. It's really, really great. Oh, well. Thank you. And I hope that everyone now on World Refugee Day will take a moment to think about your message. Yes. Thank you so much, Martina. Bye. Right. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Da.